the idea behind throwing these just for fun or is there yeah we initially did it for fun to where people were starving to go to parties right and we're like let's just do it for fun we planned it in like a week at a warehouse and then like g easy showed up like carnage uh miley cyrus's sister noah like there's just so much talent that ended up showing up we're like oh this is cool wow (laughs) so then we just started doing them every year Wherever you guys are watching this show, I would truly appreciate it if you follow or subscribe. It helps a lot with the algorithm. It helps us get bigger and better guests, and it helps us grow the team. Truly means a lot. Thank you guys for supporting, and here's the episode. Welcome back, guys. I'm here with the founder of Unruly Agency, Tara Electra. How's it going? Thanks so much for having me, Sean. Of course. We've been talking about this for a while. I know. I can't wait to to dive into your mind. This (laughs) is an industry I don't know much about, and to see you crush it, it's, it's awesome. Vice versa, you're crushing it on your podcast, so I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm trying. So you're coming <laughs> off a, a huge Halloween party. Yeah. I saw a lot of uh, posts on social media about it. How many people came? Oh, uh, we fit like 2,000 in there, but I want to say like collectively there was like 4,000. Holy. It was crazy. That's it, insane. It's wild because every year it gets more and more people want to come, so we always try to get a bigger and bigger venue. Yeah. But Every time we get a bigger venue, there's just even more people that are outside trying to come. And we give out wristbands before, but for some reason, we're trying to figure out the... 2,000 people it. snuck in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're like, what's going on? That's so it was insane. like wrapped around the building. Oh my gosh. Um, but it's cool. We kind of like are now known for like the ho- the best Halloween party in LA. So I mean, yeah. Cool. I haven't heard of any that big, not even close. Yeah. What's yeah. the uh, the idea behind throwing these just for fun or is there... Yeah, we initially did it for fun, like right after when no one had any parties to really go to or people were starving to go to parties right and we're like let's just do it for fun we planned it in like a week at a warehouse and then like g easy showed up like carnage uh miley cyrus's sister noah like there's just so much talent that ended up showing up we're like oh this is cool wow (laughs) so then we just started doing them every year yeah that's cool i was here in la during COVID. i remember if you got caught having a party they would shut your water off (laughs) yeah. <laughs> it happened to Bryce Hall, and yeah, <laughs> that I was remember cra- that. yeah, that was he kept crazy. Doing them. That I was know, crazy. like I, I still can't believe that was a thing. Honestly, <laughs> they really didn't want that. you meeting anyone. <laughs> yeah. How did you even manage staying here during that, or did you dip? Yeah, uh, no, I actually just put my head down and worked nonstop. I mean, that's how I am, anyways. But I actually kind of enjoyed because there's no yeah? distractions. Yeah. Wow, that's like the first time I've heard someone say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I like I, I enjoy just like waking up and working and not feeling like I had to go meet people or okay. had to go to events um, just because I grew up in L.A. So working in the entertainment industry, there's always like something to do or yeah. a birthday or a business thing. And like it's it's a lot. So it was nice to just like go into silence and just work. So that's yeah. when I feel like our business really catapulted. Yeah. How, how were you able to navigate the L.A. scene so well? A lot of people come here, they get eaten up. Yeah. They kind of just fall off. I don't know how to explain it, but you know what I yes, mean, right? Yes, I definitely know what you mean. It's funny because I grew up in L.A., and so I always, I obviously hear that everyone says people in L.A. like they suck and they're rude and all these things. But yeah. most of the people I actually meet that are from L.A. are actually super down to earth. Hmm. And I think it's more so just like people that come here and think that everyone's stuck up in the certain way that they feel like they have to fit that mold mm. of being that way. And so it kind of has this like pretentious era or like vibe about it. But um, for me, I feel like why I've gotten a long way is because I'm actually just genuine Mm -hmm. and I actually care (laughs) about the people I'm working with and that I'm around. And I think um, people are very short-sighted. So you come to LA and a lot of people are each other over in business. And I believe like your reputation is everything. So if you screw over someone, it's a small world and they'll find out through someone else. Easily, yeah. And so just being good to people and doing good business and sometimes you're screwed over and that sucks, but then you just keep going and you end up finding the good people in LA and then you build great business around it. I love that. And I've heard that from multiple people that grew up in LA, to be honest, that it's actually the people that grew up here are great, but it's the people that (laughs) (laughs) move there, I guess. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, where did that genuineness come from? Was it instilled by your parents? Um, yeah, my dad, probably my dad's a really good business person. He owns his own business too. And he's just really good to the people he works with. So nice. Him. That's cool. And I know you're big on the spiritual side as well. Yeah. You manifest, you meditate, you yes. journal. Where did yes. all that come from? Um, it's as cliche as it sounds, the secret. Have you seen the secret, the movie? I've heard of it. Yeah. It's a book it. and a movie. Um, it's 
probably the biggest way. Shout out to my first million hosted on the HubSpot Podcast Network. It is one of my favorite shows. The hosts, Sean and Sam, have both sold their companies for over eight figures to Amazon and HubSpot. They have on guests like Mr. Beast, Rob Deerdeck, Alex Ramosi, and much, much more. They bring on some of the top guys in their space. They'll help you brainstorm business ideas that you can start tomorrow. It's a very tactical podcast, a lot of advice and tips in there that you can utilize right away. I've literally seen almost every episode. It's one of my favorite shows. They do it remotely, which is super impressive. In my opinion, most podcasts need to be done in person, but these two know how to make it happen. So check them out wherever you listen to podcasts. My first million. Everyone like wakes up Hmm. to like spirituality. Um, But I just remember like before that, when certain things would happen, I'd feel like a victim, like, oh, poor me. Right. And then I watched that and I was like, oh, I'm literally creating this. Like, (laughs) I'm the one making myself sad and like feeling like my life isn't great. Mm. And so once I saw that, I was like, oh, this is crazy. Let me just test things out. And I started trying to like imagine money because I was like the first thing that I was like, okay, I want to make more money. Yeah. And so I imagine all I can imagine at that time was like $20 bills. And so I imagined like $20 bills in my hands and I did that every day. And then I went to a party and I left my jacket there. It was like some friends through friends were throwing a party at an Airbnb like years ago. Mm-hmm. I left my jacket there. And then the next day I hit up one of my friends and they're like, I was like, I left my jacket at that house. And they're like, oh, I'll tell the Airbnb owner to like put our stuff outside. So I went and picked it up, got my jacket. And as I was walking back to my car, I put my hands in my pocket and I pulled out a wad of 20s. No way. I swear. And then I was like, oh, shit, this is crazy. And then so from there, I just went down a rabbit hole and I was like, wow, there's the world is so powerful and like we're literally creating it. And so our beliefs are everything. And like it's all about just breaking through what our limiting beliefs are to get to the next level. For sure. And everything I have now, I've manifested. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, Yeah. it's so easy to have that victim mentality you mentioned earlier. I used to have that and I feel like a lot of people still have it. Yeah. How long did it take you to break that? Um, I still have it in certain areas of my life that I'm like, oh, there, I'm doing it there in that area. Right. Like, um, so it, I do it sometimes in certain areas. So I feel like I'm always having to work on myself in different scenarios and situations that I'm working on becoming mm. my best version. Yeah. Um, but I've gotten way better since I was younger. And I think that it's hard to remind yourself that if something bad happens, not to just be like, oh, my life is, or or this sucks, or mm-hmm. I can never win in this scenario, or business is too hard. Like, I've been screwed over so many times in business. I bet. So many times before I became successful. And even now that I'm successful, there's people that still screw me over, For right? sure. It never goes away, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's hard in those scenarios not to feel like a victim. Yeah. And to just be like, okay, well, what is the learning lesson in this? And yeah. what am I? So I think I'm always working on it still. So getting screwed over, what are some specific moments you remember that really was a big learning lesson for you? Um. Are you interested in coming on the Digital Social Hour podcast as a guest? We'll click the application link below in the description of this video. We are always looking for cool stories, cool entrepreneurs to talk to about business and life. Click the application link below and here's the episode, guys. Bad partner. Yeah, I've 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 created like so many businesses before Unruly. Mm-hmm. I've so many. I've tried literally every area of monetizing on the internet. Yeah. Um, and so with that, I've partnered with different people and mostly men. And so <laughs> I remember when I was first starting out, I was like, everyone would be like, "Oh, what, it's so hard for women to be in business." And then I was like, "Well, that's just a belief. Like, <laughs> why would you say that?" Yeah, you know, because yeah. I knew about like creating my own reality. And I was like, if anything, it's like a superpower because we can open doors that most men, it's very hard to open doors because most of the people that own the business are men. Right. And men have a guard up with other men trying to work with them, right? Ego, As yeah. a girl, they're always like, oh, you're good. Yeah. What can you possibly do? <laughs> <laughs> so like, For sure. In so, business, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like it's a power because you can open a lot of doors, but then it's all about, you know, you have to know, you have to be on point and actually do what you're say do what you say you're going to do and know what you're speaking about. And so I think that a lot of times, you know, I was that way, but there was a lot of men that underestimated me and screwed me over. Mm. 
And then fast forward to this day, I've went to like meetings with some of like the biggest companies and some of those people are like their employees and I'm like in the meeting to work with their, wow. their company. And I'm just like, hi, <laughs> <laughs> what's up? Everything comes full circle, right? Yeah. I truly believe in karma. You know, what you put out is what you're going to get. And yeah. that's just, that shows it right there. Yeah. I mean, they screwed you over. Now you're working with their boss. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's crazy. And I'm like, it's, I literally remember those times and like, crying and being so hurt about it and some of these people I was so close with mm. and feeling like you know we have such down points in our lives when we fail in business and I just remember there was a point where I got the house that I've always dreamed of getting I have the business that I always dreamed of having and one day I was at my house and I had all my friends over for my birthday and I like walked away for a second and I'm like wow even after all the times that I like went to such a low and like doubted myself and thought I wasn't good enough and all this stuff, I still got here, wow. you know? Yeah. And so that's what's so powerful, I feel like, for people trying to get into business is like we all get screwed over and we all don't believe in ourselves 100% mm -hmm. of the time. And you could still get back up and do something amazing. It's all about just getting back up and doing it again. Absolutely. I still get screwed over. I still get scammed. I got scammed last month. I mean, it's, it's part of the game. <laughs> yeah. It's like crazy. you need those moments to get to the next level. Yeah. It's not just going to be a straight path like uphill. Yeah, and that's where people, I think people get that impression seeing it on social media. But then when they start doing it and they have that first moment, they give up. Mm -hmm. But that, uh, that moment makes you stronger. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. So what was that first breakthrough with Unruly? Was it successful like year one right off the gate or did it take some time? It actually was successful right off the gate, which is wild. And it's it's crazy because I had so many other ideas and things that I thought were like amazing and we're going to do so well. And when we first started on Rolly, I didn't honestly think it was going to be what it was. Right. I just thought it was like another thing I was going to build on the side of what I'm doing. Mm. And then um, we just launched I just knew all the pieces that were needed to help creators monetize. And obviously I did my best to like put those things together, but I didn't know it was going to work so synergistically as it did. Mm -hmm. And so what I look at that as is like when preparation meets opportunity, like I've been in this space for so long. Yeah. And so I knew all the areas in which creators needed to be successful, what they were lacking and, um, so I put those all in under one roof with my previous business partner and it actually worked and it worked off the first influencer we launched and then wow. we were like, oh, and then we just put our heads down and like started going crazy. And yeah. So who was the first influencer? Um, she's not even really that big. It's this girl that has like 300K followers. Okay. And we just made her like 30 grand really quickly. Wow. And we're like, oh, let's go more. And then we just did more and then happened. And so many creators weren't making money. And then I had this huge network of creators I was working with for years. So I was able to just sign, 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 yeah. sign and keep going. Man, I love what you said about like opportunity meeting it because you, you took five, 10, 15 years to build that network. Yeah. And then you had the business to sort of help them out. Exactly. But I think people try to do the other way around first. Mm -hmm. They try to launch the business without the network, mm -hmm. without the connections, and it's way harder. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And that's, that's the thing with the podcast, because I tried launching one five years ago, total flop. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I was a nobody. And then when I built some connections, it was way easier. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was a total flop. And I think a lot of people have podcasts that fail and a big part of it is the network. Mm -hmm. They don't have interesting guests that they could bring on yet. Yeah. Podcasts are not easy. Not at all. People <laughs> think hard. they could just turn on a camera and get it's views. It's like running a business. There's so many podcasts. What are you going to do that's different from the other 99 million podcasts? <laughs> 99 million. I know. That's where I know this podcasts are so saturated now. I yeah. know. And so I just, I've been wanting to do one for like over two years. And I was always like, oh, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I'm running this business, whatever. And then I was like, well, I need something that like fulfills me mm -hmm. with my own, like that doesn't involve making money. Like I don't care. I'm not doing my podcast to make money. I yeah. do my podcast because it's fulfilling. And like these are the conversations I'm having with clients regularly and like putting those on a podcast. I feel like I learn so much mm -hmm. and other people learn so much about the conversations we're having. And I so I feel like I, I help bring out parts of, successful business owners and creators that they might not even know people want to know about them. Yeah. 
Because you, know? you got the inside scoop on everyone. I mean, yeah. you're friends with these creators. Yeah. Most times creators work with a business. It's not a personal relationship like yours is. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the approach you took with Unruly, right? You wanted to build friendships with all your creators. Mm -hmm. That was hard, too. I'm, like, learning that, too, because I, I became friends with a lot of them. Mm -hmm. But at the, at the same time, it is business. So creating that fine balance with the creator is not easy because a lot of them are like my age. Right. <laughs> like, so you don't want to charge them as much. And yeah, I know what you mean. It's just like weird because I like see these people when I go out too. So yeah. it's like creating that fine line of always being professional is, is very important. But at the end of the day, I care so much about them. Mm -hmm. So it is more than just money for me of like where they're going in their careers. And I genuinely see them so beyond where they're at today. Mm. So I feel like that's felt when they're working with me. And so yeah. Yeah. So everyone wants to be a big creator, obviously, these days. Uh, I think YouTuber is like the number one job aspiration for kids. What have you seen in all these creators you work with that makes them so successful? Um, I know I always am like trying to hone that down on my podcast. I'm mm -hmm. always like, what is this? Like, what is your unique quality that brought you to where you are today? Yeah. And I ask them directly. Um, but I think a lot of it comes down to their belief. Like, there are some creators and celebrities that are legit narcissists and they just believe they are God's gift to earth, you know? Yeah, like, I think I know. Zero <laughs> doubt. <laughs> know a few of those. <laughs> yeah. And they have no like doubt in their mind and those people are very successful, right? Because they just know and believe it. And then there's people that aren't that way that are very successful and they, they just do believe in themselves. They do believe that they have something to give back and they're fulfilled by their fans and, and what they're giving. Mm. Um, but I think... It's weird. I've seen all different types. Like there's some creators that they just don't, they just don't try so hard. Hmm. Like I've seen creators that are like, they don't even work that hard, but they just seem to I think to if get they're there. so attractive, like they don't have to try <laughs> as hard, right? There's some of them that I just feel like they just, they have a strong belief in themselves that they don't think that they need to grind that hard to get there. Interesting. Yeah. And I'm the total opposite. I don't, I don't I'm the total to opposite yeah. too. I can't relate with it. I'm like, I always have to like, I don't, I, I believe I have to work hard to yeah. be successful. I get anxiety if I don't work hard. I'm and like, like wait, why myself. am I not working hard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like judge myself. Um, so I've seen that type of creator where they just, they believe in themselves so much that they just know that they're going to do it or they see something on the internet and they're like, oh, that's easy. I'll do it. And they just kind of like at ease about it. Mm -hmm. And then I've seen others that are very successful because they're very regiment and they're, they treat it like a business. Their, um, their social media, they put like monthly calendars together. They know what days they're shooting, mm. co which content they have people that are helping them shoot that content. They yeah. have an editing team. They ha they post on certain times at different days, and they're studying what works and what doesn't work. And I there's those creators. Yeah. Um, but I think it's all about really comes down to like your belief in yourself, and if you genuinely feel like you can get there, and it's constantly looking at your limiting beliefs that's making you think you can't. Yeah. And then I love that. I think you're so successful because you found a problem all these creators have, which is monetizing. Yeah. Right. Like years ago, no one really knew how to do that. Mm -hmm. It was get paid from the views and that was it. Mm -hmm. But now you're helping them with other avenues, right? Mm -hmm. Brands and all this stuff. Yeah. Where did that idea sort of stem from? I think that uh, because I was friends with so many of them, I started out as an assistant to someone that worked with one creator. And then I started out pitching myself to um, music festivals to bring creators to mm. their music festivals to help push ticket sales. And so when I did that, I created community around festivals like EDC and so forth, mm -hmm. Rolling Loud. Um, and so I got to like really become even closer with them and create a community around them. And most creators, they they love community because a lot of them don't like to reach out to each other and ask for favors. Right. You probably see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, why do you feel weird? Just reach out to them. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so... Um, so bringing them together. And then when I kind of created that community around things I was doing, I started to really understand most of their problems. And a lot of them had, you know, millions of followers and weren't making money, you know? And I think Yeah, you'd be surprised. Even to this day, people haven't really figured it out. Yeah. But back then, yeah, you could have 5 million followers and not make 10K a year. Exactly. So I, that was always a big struggle for them is like, okay, I'm famous, but I'm not making money. Like, that's a weird feeling. Right. Um, and so... They were always living from like brand deal to brand deal of just needing to pitch themselves to a brand or needing to make their 
like social media profiles fit brand aesthetics so they're not like being authentic at all yeah a lot of them back then were trying to be perfect for what a brand would look for like oh this is exactly what you want right and so now I always knew that was a problem for them and a lot of times I helped them get those brand deals but then I started to be like okay the internet's changing and the fans are starving for authenticity right people started to realize like they don't want to see your perfect life and you know that's not relatable at all Mm -hmm. and so now fans are starving for that type of content and then the creators that were able to be more authentic and creative with their content are getting the most super fans for sure that would buy anything that they do and so I now saw that, you know, paywalls are really the future for creators. Any way that you can monetize your own content, because then you could be authentic to what you want to do. Whether yeah. that's through like podcasts, YouTubes, OnlyFans, um, Snapchat is now, I consider a paywall because they put ads in between your content. Um, TikTok, you're, if you create longer form videos, you can monetize them. Or yeah. you can unlock lock co- more content on TikTok now. So different ways where you can monetize your own fans, I think, is the next Wave. absolutely i mean i see i've heard of the numbers on snapchat it's unreal yeah i mean it, it doesn't even make sense to me because i don't know anyone that uses snapchat to be honest yeah but the money's insane on there for some reason yeah it's crazy yeah and, and they, all they're doing is really just posting about their life all day 100 <laughs> photos of a selfie and random dogs and stuff yeah, yeah it's but it's cool because um platforms are starting to realize you need to mon- help the creators now in order that for them to keep producing content yeah it's like how long can you live it's as you see with your podcast it's a full-time job Mm -hmm. and so if you're not monetizing it how are you going to keep doing it right and so i think that the platforms are starting to realize oh we want content constantly being produced so people are still on their phones yeah you need to now help the creators make money by doing that absolutely that's cool how does your talent feel about AI? Because now they're mimicking voice, they're mimicking appearance. Yeah. Are they scared of it? Are they embracing it? What's been the feedback there? Mixed. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, I think it's an interesting, I don't even fully know where it's heading, but I would say it's going to probably disrupt the internet space in the next like two to three years. Mm. Um, and I think that, you know, It's all about just understanding where AI is going and constantly learning so that you're not behind Mm -hmm. Um, and probably owning your AI. So like it's not being used without you being okay with it. Yeah. Um, But I would hope that at the end of the day, fans still like real humans. We'll see. We'll see. (laughs) I was, it's scary. I was talking to someone in Hollywood, does a bunch of big movies and they're basically all in on AI. So their biggest expense is actors, obviously, like mm-hmm. 20, 30 million a movie. They're going to start making AI actors. Yeah. And you'll have no idea real. it's a real person or not. That's scary. <laughs> and these AI songs are getting good, man. The Drake ones were, were yeah. pretty fire. <laughs> that's the stuff that scares me the most because then there's no, like, originality and there's no, like, like what's cre- what's being creative anymore. If someone can just create that quicker, if an AI can create that faster than you, right? It's like- Yeah, it is scary. You, you really need like a high income skill that's not easily like duplicated to kind of make it because they're going to replace all the easy jobs at first and then they're going to come for people like us and we got to be adapting <laughs> or they're going to be running all the biggest talent agencies themselves. <laughs> I know, it's like crazy. I know. It's nuts. Yeah, we'll see where it goes. So how many people <laughs> are assigned? I was on the site. There were so many creators. Like, it's crazy. Yeah, we have 150. Jeez. Yeah. We could have more. We're just very selective at our company. Okay. Um, I would say there's a lot of other, like, competitors popping up that just sign, 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 sign. And we have tons and tons of submissions yeah. regularly. Um, but we want to give a certain level of service to creators because any creator that leaves us majority of the time ends up coming back because they can't oh really find, yeah because they can't find that service anywhere else and so we have a full team in la and west hollywood so we actually have our team come to the office nice tons of employees with company laptops everything like a full-fledged real company that's so, legit yeah so we're scaling and and growing and we have a very professional team that really looks at this as a long-term career mm-hmm. and so the level of service our team members are able to give back because they look at it that way is just unmatched. Yeah. Sounds like you built a great company, company culture. You really care about your clients, yes. which is cool. 
Because you yes. could have, like you said, probably had a thousand people signed. Yeah, yeah, and then that just doesn't do well for you because now you're you're so thin, you're spread so thin, and um, it's all about giving like a good service and setting things up properly and creating a good foundation before you move to the next thing. Um, so that's what we really focus on doing. Yeah, no, I love that because I get pitched talent agencies all the time, and it's like these guys have thousands of people. <laughs> I'm irrelevant. Like they don't, they're not going to care about me. They just want a monthly retainer. Exactly. And there are like, I, I've even now heard like the UTAs and the CAAs, like they have thousands and thousands of clients. And so a lot of the clients that even sign to those agencies, a lot of times get shelved and people forget yeah. that they're even on the roster. You and know? you rarely hear good stories about the talent agencies that have monthly retainers, honestly, mm -hmm. like rarely, mm -hmm. you got to be like a big name they care about. Mm -hmm. or like have a big following like that Bobby Altoff girl or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, she's huge. So I'm glad to see someone like you making the talent agency space look good. <laughs> Thank you. Because yeah. it's very rare where both parties are happy in that space. Yeah. And all my clients uh, that are signed to you guys speak highly of you guys. So. Oh, that makes me happy. Yeah. I love to hear it. So what's the future? What's exciting you? What's next? Um, just constantly scaling. We, we actually make a lot of like shows. TV shows, but we they're put across the internet. Um, so we have about like 30 shows no one even knows, really. Wow. That we're yeah, producing I didn't even them. know that. <laughs> yeah. So constantly building out that department um, and just scaling into different creator economies and, and getting to the level where a lot of celebrities are not even, they don't even have real social media teams. So we've been meeting with a lot of different types of talent that still doesn't even know how to monetize their social media they're probably you know making so much money on tv and things like that but they actually don't know what to do with their five million followers on instagram yeah so just scaling into those markets and and being the future of what monetizing on social media looks like is where we're constantly heading so. yeah i think you could definitely help celebrities out because like you said they don't really post on social media a lot of them mm -hmm. and if they do it's an ad and it's like not organic exactly yeah yeah. Especially these pro athletes, they just throw up ads and it's, yeah, you could tell it's just paid, pay to play, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It needs to be more like integrated. Like that's why I like TikTok. I feel like a lot of ads on there are more natural. Yeah. TikTok's so crazy because I feel like it does so well because it's so like authentic. Yeah. And you see sides of creators that you never usually see on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like it just shows where the market and the industry is going. Like people are dying for you to just be like authentic and a real person. And so, especially the younger generation, they can like see through really quickly. Absolutely, they're sharp <laughs> with that because they grew up on social media their whole lives. Yeah, it's so they're crazy. used to that BS. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was on the site also a ton of big brand partners. I was like, holy crap! How do you go about working with these big brands? Yeah. So thankfully, we have a lot of them reach out to us, which is cool because they. It's wild because I've traveled around the world, even like to but to do to Dubai and I've had people tell us they know us even there. Wow. Yeah, so it's it's really like surreal that I've we've traveled to different places and people actually know what we who we are. Mm -hmm. And so I we just had a lot of brands reaching out to us to work with us and I think nowadays for brands it's all about creating community around your brand. Like you've seen it now with, you know, it started with really Revolve. You probably saw Revolve around the world, the clothing yeah. brand brand. They did it very well. And now like Opali and White Fox and all these ones that are popping up are creating these influencer events and groups. And mm -hmm. so brands are now starting to realize they they need community around their brand. They need to have a, like a meaning or a voice around them of yeah. what they stand for. And so I think that's now the future and evolution for brands because there's so many brands. So many. I see <laughs> yeah. them all getting into content now, honestly. Yeah. And all working with influencers. So that that's exciting for you guys. Yeah. So yeah. helping them create kind of like a connection with their fan base and community is really what we're good at. Awesome. Well, yeah. what's next for you personally? Where can people find you and where can people find Unruly? Um, so Unruly Agency on Instagram and all social media platforms. And for me personally, just scaling this business to the biggest company ever in social media. Let's go. And um, my podcast interviewing, you know, amazing people that are scaling their companies and are doing it in a unique way because... Unruly is all about not doing things the traditional route. Um, I like didn't go to college and I dropped out of high school to be homeschooled and do things myself. And I never knew if I was going to be successful, but I did everything you wouldn't think to do and I still made it. So mm -hmm. I think 
everyone can create their own path to success. So I like to bring on people on my podcast to be like, okay, how did you do that? And where did you go with it? And what's your quality? And so my podcast is called Billion Dollar Baby. And you can find it on all social media platforms, like Spotify and YouTube. So. Nice. Inspirational. Thanks so much for coming on, Tara. Thank you for having me. Of course. The best. Thanks for watching, guys, as always. And I'll see you next time. That was fun.